thank you all for coming. You are some of the luckiest people in not only New York City, but in the entire country. This camera uh, is being, it, this was sent from Tyler Stableford directly from the horse's mouth, specifically here for this class. I've gone through a lot of trial and tribulation to get this camera to you, so I'm really grateful that you're here to listen to me. Uh, so if you don't know what I'm talking about and you just wandered in here really quick, uh, this is the 1DX. I am Ashley McLaughlin. I am the camera product educator for the entire Northeast. What I'm going to do here for the next hour is just give you some uh, highlights and some, some points about the camera. I will do my best to answer every question that you guys have, but you have to understand the disclaimer that I have given. I've only read every theory about this camera. I have not applied it because essentially this camera doesn't exist. You are looking at a unicorn. Okay, this, there is only, I think, 20 production models in the country and not all of them are actually used for shooting. Um, they're used for demos. So you guys are really fortunate that not only you get to see it, and I'll let you guys hold it uh, for a little bit, but you guys get to shoot with it, or, you know, Joey gets to shoot with it and print from it. Not everybody who gets to uh, in court for, uh, get this camera gets to do all of those things. So thank you, B&H, for, for setting this all up. It's pretty cool. So uh, someone asked me what the X is for. It's totally for extreme. But if you don't like that and you feel kind of corny saying it, it also has to do with our 10th uh, version of the 1 series and our Pro series. So that's where the X comes in. Um, if we take a look. At the breakdown of our, all of our EO system, this camera falls exactly at the top. This is a fully professional camera. You're not going to find any sort of auto on this camera. And as every bell and whistle that Canon has, the only one down from this would be the 5D Mark III. The 5D Mark II is still currently in the lineup. I, I don't know how long. You can't ask me that because I don't know. Um, but the new announcements, these are the two newest models. So it's the ultimate in EOS utility. What is uh, an EOS shooting? What does that mean? Um, we've really targeted some of the issues that you know, consumers and photographers and pros have addressed for the longest time. Autofocusing, metering, high speed performance, improved video quality. Uh, these are things that the 1DX has not only targeted, but succeeded in perfecting. So if we look at a little comparative chart, does anyone here own a one series camera? So a any of them. Uh, do we have the APS uh, H sensor? We have the full frame general consensus. Yeah, your name? Just shout it out. Full frame. Full frame. Full frame. All right. So this is a full frame. Okay. So if you guys have the Mark IV, the 1D Mark IV, you guys know that that's a 1.3 crop. Um, what they've done really is they've kind of married the two one series bodies together. Uh, and they've created this magnificent beast of a camera. Um, everything in red is what we've improved on. So we <laughs> I'm not going to read them all, but we've improved on um, frames per second, on AI servo, on metering, on the processor. Um, we're going to talk all about these things in a great, great depth. Uh, there's been corrections in camera for both peripheral illumination and chromatic uh, or ab 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 aberration. Uh, this is also rated for 400,000 cycles. Um, I know a lot of you are really excited about the 5D3 as well, and you're wondering about you know the biggest differences. This is one of the biggest differences between those two cameras is that this is rated for 400,000, while the Mark III is only rated for 150,000. So depending on your needs as a photographer. It'll depend, again, on what camera you buy. So a little bit about the camera. 100% viewfinder. It's an intelligent viewfinder, which is not an electronic viewfinder, as some people are inclined to believe, but an electronic viewfinder that allows us to see grid lines. It displays uh, autofocusing points depending on your lens. Um, It'll tell you if you're in extended ISOs or if you have your auto light optimizer on. Uh, it also has an electronic level inside of the viewfinder, so you don't have to go to the back LCD screen. So this is an intelligent viewfinder. It's not an electronic one. It's going to give you specific details to what you're shooting in specifically. This is what the viewfinder looks like, 61 points of autofocusing. It's, it's marvelous. It's beautiful. And we're going to actually get into how all the autofocus points are broken down, too. So some of the new things that you're going to see, um, 
Obviously, your shooting mode, we have a high speed, 14 frames a second. I was showing it off to some of you before. I'll show it off to you guys again, for those of you who weren't here. Um, battery check, AF uh, status indicator. So this is a slightly different screen than what you guys are used to, but a lot of the information that you're accustomed to is here. Okay, so it's not terribly foreign, it's just a little bit of a learning curve. The other thing that's a little bit of a learning curve are the menus. Uh, both the 1DX and the 5D Mark III have entirely new uh, menu systems. Uh, if you come up and you take a look at it, they're broken up into top tabs, shooting, autofocus. Autofocus uh, in both cameras have their own menu. So you don't have to go digging through your custom functions in order to really fine tune your autofocusing. They've been dedicated their own menus. Then your standard, your playback, your setup, your custom functions, and my menu. Each one of your shooting menus has secondary menus that you go through. You navigate through these top menus by hitting the quick, uh, the Q button in the back. Does anyone have a 7D? Okay, a lot of features, believe it or not, not a lot, but enough features that are in the 7D have kind of incorporated into the newer cameras, such as that Q button and accessing some uh, menu options through the back LCD screen so you don't have to go digging when you're, uh, when you're in the middle of a shoot. The other thing that Canon has added in both of the new cameras is a feature guide. Um, this doesn't hurt you, this only helps you. It's so that you don't really have to carry, or the idea is, so you don't have to carry your manual around. And about 80% or so of the camera has uh, this info button, or this help button. And anytime you see the info or the help button, you press uh, info or help, and you're going to get a definition of what that function is. So if you're unsure of your autofocusing uh, scenarios or your cases, you can define them and see which one is best for you without having to pick up a manual and looking in. And it doesn't help you, really, in the long run, because if you don't need it, it doesn't take up any less space. Someone had asked me about shutter actuations. The EOS monitoring system has the ability to tell you how many cycles, up to 1,000. So it'll say less than 1,000, I think less than 2,000. Uh, because this camera is so new, um, I don't know how many it has now. I haven't checked it. Uh, but again, this is something in theory. So I can't tell you exactly down to the pinprick how to do this. But it does have this feature in it. Uh, it's going to tell you your serial number. And this is where you're going to find your firm firmware version. So anyone who has a one series camera knows every button on it. They probably you know, know it better than their wife or their husband. Uh, with this, the buttons have been moved around quite a bit. All of the playback options have been moved to the left of the camera. So where you're used to looking at your playback and zooming in with these buttons up here to the right and the left, that's been changed to uh, control primarily with your left hand. A little bit of a learning curve, but once you really get into it, it, it makes a lot more sense. Okay, so some things that are different here is the zoom in, zoom out button, uh, your playback zoom, and uh, your delete button also to protect, uh, easy AF point selection, even when the camera is held vertically. So what they did was on the extended grip, they've given you the joystick option that you have when you're shooting landscape. Um, the Q button is also that's something new. So this is going to be able to access all of our menus from the back LCD screen. So if you want to change your picture style, you don't have to go into the menu now. You can just get it straight from here. Um, and the Live View button. Again, some of the One Series cameras in Live View, it was the middle set button to get to your Live View. And it was hidden if it wasn't activated. This has a dedicated Live View button. Um, you can also control how you start recording your video. Um, this is set to MFN, but you can set it to any other button you want. Okay, so the front has two programmable buttons. If you look at it, it looks like four, but one angle is for shooting vertically and the other one is for shooting horizontally. And these two buttons can be set to relatively whatever you want. Do you want them the depth of, uh, depth of field preview? Do you want them to be able to switch from JPEG to RAW? These two buttons are customizable to whatever you want. And the cool thing about them is they're contoured differently. One's a smooth surface and one is uh, an indented sur uh, surface. So you're not going to get confused in which one to shoot with. So like I said, this is the back LCD. Again, this is something that you see in the 7D. As you also see it in the Rebels. And as you know, juvenile as you may have, uh, think it is as a feature, it's actually quite beneficial when you're looking to get into anything like um, uh, picture style or if you want to change metering or um, light optimizer, you can change it all from here, which is pretty cool. Dual CF card slots. Thumbs up. Um, you have the ability to do 
three options. You can set it to one, record to one, and then automatically overflow to the other. You can have it record where both of them are recording as backups, or you can set your cards to shoot JPEG and RAW on two separate cards. So you have the options. So we have a new shutter. I'm not an engineer, so a lot of this goes in one ear and out the other, to be honest. But what I do know is that it's a lighter shutter because it has to, it has to be. It's shooting at 12 to 14 frames a second. Um, it's carbon fiber, lightweight, more durable. The precision on it is um, spectacular, even at the higher frame rates. Uh, the other thing that's been changed is also the mirror mechanism. This body is super durable. This is magnesium through and through. The 5D Mark III is a magnesium outside with an aluminum uh, innard, an aluminum skeleton. So this thing through and through is the most durable, weather sealed, dust resistant camera that Canon has on the market. If you are an abuser and a user and you like dropping stuff, don't give you any babies, but uh, I would recommend you go ahead and buy one of these guys, okay? Because I would trust this over, you know, a 5D Mark III when it comes to real rough, tough durability. So I don't know if I have any pixel counters out there, okay? But if you do know this is an 18 megapixel camera and you go, hey, Ashley, why is it 18 megapixels? Well, Canon decided that this was enough resolution that you needed and where they wanted to concentrate on was the lower IS, or the higher ISOs for lower light capability. Um, the actual pixel size is larger than the one series. Uh, it's 1.25 micrometers larger than the four which is pretty cool. And what they've done with these pixels is they've moved them closer together and created what's called the mirror, uh, gapless mirror system. And this is just gathering light from different angles to be more, uh, more effective in gathering low light. Um, if you guys don't know, the ISOs extend up to 204,000, I believe. And I was joking with Lauren, shooting photos of her at ISO 10,000, and they're clean. With a little bit of noise reduction and shooting in RAW, they're completely usable. This is a change in the game. All your F4 glass is completely usable in low light situations. So ISO range native in the camera is up to 51,200, expandable up to 204,800. That's expanded, OK? So it's not native. It's not uh, you are interpolating at this point. Here's a quality at 12,800. Can we agree? I mean, everybody's assumpt everybody has their own threshold of ISO, right? What we find acceptable and what others find. But is this something that you would sell? Can you get away with that? Joey, would you get away with that? Get away with that. OK. And if he says that he's a master, it's a basic fundamental. Um, so this camera has two Digic 5 Plus processors, two of them. The 5D Mark III only has one. Okay, this camera also has a Digic 4 dedicated to autofocusing and metering as well. So this camera is a behemoth. I'm going to put it down because it's getting kind of heavy. We can look up here. So it's 17 times faster than the original Digic 4, and it's three times faster than the Digic 5. And the Digic 5 processor is what we have in our point and shoots with the new HS system. Um, so this processor enables us to go to 14 to 12 to 6 frames a second, depending on the camera. It allows the camera to be able to shoot at such extended ISOs. It's allowing the camera to have such an intricate autofocusing and metering system. Um, we really redesigned the last two cameras from the ground up. Canon is really dedicated to not only education and educating their consumers, but they're really dedicated in getting feedback from pro photographers and from um, uh, consumers themselves and using that feedback to really mold their products. So all of this really is from you guys, from going to trade shows, from talking to people like us, from talking to engineers, from talking to upper heads and saying, you know what I think would be really cool is da 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 da. Or you know, you should really extend your uh, you know, AEB to three stops. Or you should really be able to shoot seven, stop, uh, sh seven shots as opposed to three. So all of this feedback that you've given us has been put into these cameras. And the thing that drives all of that availability is the Digic 5 Plus processor. So again, this, has the, this processor allows us to shoot at 12 or 14 frames a second, allows us to go up to 51,000 ISO natively. It allows us to be able to have such an intricate autofocusing system. And so we have low noise processing up to two stops improvement over the four. Does anyone have a four? four. Feel, 
Are you gonna trade it in? <laughs> After the, this isn't a sales pitch. I just want to make that clear. This is just informing you guys. And, you know, I'm not here to. I know some of you came up to me and made it a point and tell me you shoot an icon. That's awesome. This is just to show you what is out on the market. I am not here to convince you to sell all of your glass and come to the red side. That's not why I'm here. <laughs> That's horrible of me. It is a five-stop improvement over the 1DS. That's incredible. 14 frames per second JPEG only. This is also a mirror lockup. Okay, so you can't continuously autofocus. So someone asked me what you would use that for. Well, you could possibly use it if you're trying to track a subject going across the sky and they're not changing direction forward or backwards. They're on the same focal plane. You could just follow them. Um, but you're, you lose the ability to autofocus, uh, track autofocus because your mirror is essentially locked up. Uh, in camera, multiple exposure, which is, I don't know if someone that's, you know, to interest of someone. I was actually playing around with it last night. It's pretty, pretty cool. There's lens chromatic aberration correction per lens. There is about, I think, 20 lenses registered, no, between 20 and 40 registered uh, in this camera to correct for. So you throw the lens on and the lens data is going to be in there. If the lens data isn't in there, then you can go to the Canon website and download that specific lens data. The most current and new and popular lenses are in there, but if you have some obscure lens, it might not be in there. But each lens, if you turn it on, is going to be corrected for peripheral illumination and chromatic aberration, which is, is pretty cool. Okay. You have the ability to shoot um, all eye and IPB movie. We'll get a little bit more into that. There are just two different kinds of compressions to the video. Um, and again, this has everything to do with the Digic 5 Plus processor. Uh, and it'll take up the UDMA 7 compact flash cards, so you guys don't have to go out and buy brand new cards. Just saying. So continuous high speed shooting, 12 frames a second, JPEG and RAW, 14 frames a second, you're only getting JPEG. You could set it up fine, but you're only getting JPEG out of it. Um, this is what it sounds like, because I know you guys are all antsy for it. This is 12. And this is 14. Sorry. Like I said, when I first got this camera last night, I was like, can I just stand up here for an hour and just have you listen to that? Because it's pretty amusing. Um, but if you guys do come up and you play with it a little bit, you'll see that the mirror is locked up on this feature, on this function, that you can't physically see through it. And that means that the mirror is not doing your focusing, which means that you cannot track anything. The drive system, like I said, frame, 12 frames per second, and then you have 14 frames with the super high speed. What it'll indicate on your LCD is it'll blink. The H high speed is going to give you a blinking, so you know that you're in 14 frames a second. Um, at ISO's 25,600, your maximum uh, shutter speed drops to 10, just so you know. So here's the new mirror design. Uh, to not put too fine a point on it, what they've done is they've kind of weighted the mirror down so that there's less bounce, which allows you more accuracy when you're doing autofocus tracking. Again, not an engineer, so this stuff kind of bores me. Let's talk a little bit about imaging and metering. So, oops, oh, sorry. So something that Canon has really incorporated is the concept of metering not only off of contrast and tone, but metering off of red and green wavelengths. Notoriously, uh, red and green have either been over or underexposed respectively. What Canon's done is created a metering system that kind of corrects for that uh, and takes into consideration your R and your G wavelengths. In addition, with the ability of the, five, the two digit 5 plus processors, you have the ability to autofocus off of face recognition in addition to color, which is pretty cool. The metering itself, though, in a bright situation, it's 252 metering zones. In low light, it's 35. The question is, well, when does it consider low light? I don't know. Canada didn't release that spec. So I don't know when the camera considers something low light and when it doesn't. It's not, there's no exact number to it. So you have intelligence subject and, uh, analysis 
for exposure, white balance, oops, sorry, autofocus, uh, light optimization, and picture style auto, which is a feature that I don't really go over. Picture style auto is uh, going to try to automatically put a filter on your JPEG. You can let it go. For this camera, it's not important. Um, but just know that the entire metering system is completely redone from the ground up. I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Like I said, each lens has lens data built into the camera. So you're going to be able to correct for peripheral illumination and chromatic aberration lens for lens. You can also shoot, you could turn it off in the camera, you could shoot raw, and you can correct for it later with your raw processing. There's an option for that in camera for your raw processing. Multiple exposure modes. It may sound kind of hokey, but playing with it last night, it's actually quite cool. And you have quite the, uh, the options for this. Um, you have the ability to do the additive system that you guys are so used to, where you're taking your own exposures and doubling them or half them, depending on how many exposures you want to merge together. You can have it so that the camera does all of the math for you, so you don't even have to think about it. And then you have something called comparative bright and comparative dark. And for someone who's doing um, weddings and they want to show a bride something immediately right off the bat, a me uh, comparative bright is you shoot against a black background and let's say you're just taking two images whatever image you decide secondary to superimpose on the first is going to take over the black uh, I believe I have uh, a slide in here for that comparative dark is vice versa you shoot on a white background and whatever image you've chosen is going to superimpose itself on the white area which is really cool because this eliminates any sort of need for a green screen because what pro photographer carries around a green screen most of them either have a white backdrop or a black backdrop, and this makes it super easy. So, the, you have, I mean, I'm not going to go through all these settings, but you have the ability in the camera to shoot every single sequence of photographs, uh, multiple exposure, or for every two, three, five, up to nine images you can merge together, you can set it so that every nine, one every nine images, that'll merge. Um, you have the ability to do um, function control or continuous shooting. If you do continuous shooting, you lose the ability to save each individual image. It just really gets saved as one major uh, composite of exposure. So here is an example of comparative bright. Okay, so we shot a bride on a back black, uh, back black drop. We've taken this photograph of a flower, and the flower has taken all the shadows and the black tones. And this is comparative dark. Okay, so it's vice versa. We've shot on a white background. The guitar is superimposed onto it and takes over the white. So, you know, this is something really cool to appease the bride right there. Like she's getting all bridezilla on you, and hey, look what we could do. And, oh, I love it. You know, and you haven't really done anything. It's just post processing the camera. If you shoot raw, these will be saved as JPEG. Whatever composites you end up getting will be saved as a JPEG. You can't save a raw multiple exposure. But you can go back later on in DPP and uh, import all of your raw files and make a multiple exposure later on. So the autofocusing system is leaps and bounds over what, was the, uh, what we had. 61 point autofocusing system. All the points are active up to 5.6, OK? There's no maximum aperture F8 shooting. Let me explain. If you guys have a 70 to 200 2 8 lens, and we put, who, who was here for the class before? We're going to talk stops. If you have a 70 to 200 2 8 and you put a two time converter on that, what's your maximum ap aperture? OK. If you have an F4 lens and you put a two time converter on it, what's your maximum aperture? What is it? F8. You've lost autofocus. Okay. In the old one series cameras, you had the center point, if anyone remem uh, remembers right. Nikon has this as well. You've lost it in this camera. And the reason that was explained to me was because they put all of their sensitive points across the, uh, across the autofocusing sensor, and they're not concentrated in the middle, maximum aperture of f8 is just not enough light for the camera to pick up and autofocus off of. So you will lose your autofocus at maximum f8. So you have five central points. They're high precision cross diagonal points at 2.8. Uh, so 2.8 and under, you're good. Those are going to be high precision. 20 outer points cross type to f4. But essentially, you have 61 autofocusing points 
regardless, up through point, uh, 5.6. So this is the old version versus the new version. So this covers 52.7%, while the other one just covered about 41.6% of the entire frame. So more, you more of your coverage, the better it and easier it is to track, right? This is what the sensor looks like. That's what it looks like in the camera, how it's arranged, and what the sensor physically looks like. So you guys can see five precision points down the middle. You have 20 cross type points on the side, and you're 21 in the middle. And here it is broken down. So the blue are 2.8 compatible, the ones on the outside are four and the rest of them are 5.6. So if you notice, everything is available at 5.6. But when you start bringing it into those lower, and le or those lower aperture lenses, you begin to get more precision autofocusing points out of them. So here it is a a physically arranged on the sensor. So you guys can get some sort of an idea. The autofocus menu has been moved to its own dedicated menu. Okay, whereas Canon had a lot of choices for autofocus in their 1D series, uh, they were kind of hidden and you kind of had to talk a little Canon language. What they've done is they've brought them out of the shadows and they've given you the ability to go straight into an autofocusing menu. There are six cases that you can change your autofocusing for tracking and each one of them has the ability to fine tune the tracking to, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, the tracking sensitivity, uh, how fast the points move, and something else. I forget off the top of my head. If someone's super interested in the fast autofocusing, let me know, and we'll, we can go over it a little more thorough after class. Um, so we have this intelligent tracking and recognition. It uses the 100,000 pixel RB, uh, RGB sensor to aid the autofocusing system. Uh, and this increases tracking performance for fast moving subjects. Um, this behavior can customize in AF only, uh, or the EOS ITR uh, AF, which focuses continue on the color or face detection. So this is something that's really new for Canon, is the concept of tracking off of RGB and faces. And from, again, I haven't gotten a chance to play with it. Um, I can't even go around the city. I have to go back and drop it off. Um, from, but what I've heard from pro photographers is this is a system that you can actually rely on. Okay, So it's not all bells and whistles. This is something that you can lock into faces and lock into color recognition and track um, properly and um, reliably. So these are the three things that you have in each case that are available. It's the acceleration and deceleration of a subject. Are you shooting cars that are you know, constantly accelerating around a track? Or are you uh, shooting track stars that start, they're not moving, then they, uh, then they go and then they stop? Uh, are you shooting baseball, again, where it's you know, no one's really moving in baseball until something happens? So you can set the sensitivity of it. Um, auto focus point auto switching, so how fast um, the points are going to be switched when tracking, and the tracking sensitivity. Um, it used to be fast and slow. I think it's on a one to two scale now because fast and slow were kind of negative terms and they didn't like using them. Um, there's one more option in this than there is for the 7D. If you guys know for your 7D, you have five options for autofocus point selection. This has six because you didn't have enough choices in life. They just want because you because you don't make decisions every day. They wanted to make this as simple as possible. So you have your spot AF. You have your single point AF. You have a single point with four point expansion, and then you also have an eight point expansion. This is what's different from the 7D. Because I know a lot of you and your plight about, you know, if, if any of you had a 5D Mark II and you, you knew what the problem was, what was the problem with the 5D Mark II? Focus. Focusing, right on. Uh, that you, you possibly had gone to a 7D because you couldn't wait for us any longer, but you were still loyal, so thanks. Um, you, if, the, if you are accustomed to these menus and these autofocusing points, giving you that one extra option of having an eight point expansion is going to make the world of difference when you're trying to track moving subjects. And then you have your zone AF that's movable and customizable. 
AF function registration. So you can use your custom controls um, to change. This is just so that you can change um, how you autofocus and what actual options you use. So for example, I had the camera set to back autofocus. Uh, Joey didn't want that. He wanted the shutter button to release the autofocus. This is something that I changed easily. You have the ability to micro adjust any lens, pretty much any lens. Okay, like I said, there's about 20 to 40 um, lenses programmed into the camera already. If you have some older or more obscure lens, chances are there is going to be lens data for it, but you're going to have to get it off the Canon website. There's only so much that could be put in the camera. Okay, so we have, oops, sorry. We have the playback options as a 3.2 inch LCD, 1 million or so dots. Um, it's very, very sharp. You guys are going to get a chance to come up and, and swarm around me and look at it. Your playback options, raw processing, uh, rotating, highlight alert, resizing, and you can also, um, I believe, lock as well. Uh, but don't quote me on that. I know that you can, you can rate and protect in the 5D Mark III. See, I've been doing training for the past week and a half on the 5D Mark III without really even seeing it. And because these cameras have so much in common, the features begin to bleed together. Um, there's very little that the 5D3 has that this camera doesn't have. So this is your in-camera processing. You have the ability for brightness, white balance, picture style, auto light optimizer, JPEG recording, color space, peripheral illumination, chromatic aberration, um, any sort of linear distortion compensation. Um, and I know some of you are like, well, why would you ever want to do any raw processing in camera? Just to give you an idea of what, I mean, if you have some time between a reception and a, and a ceremony, why not play around with a few images to get yourself in the right mindset for your workflow later on? You know, obviously, you, if you do go by the back LCD screen, then that's fine for you. But, you know, to look at it on a larger screen would behoove you. But it's nice to get, you know, if you just want to correct for your peripheral illumination and your chromatic aberration right off the bat before you even put it into your Lightroom or your DPP, you have the ability to do it right there without, you know, touching a JPEG or making it into a JPEG. You have the ability to record voice memos to each photograph. That's that. That's all I'm going to go. So let's talk a little bit about video, because I want to leave some time for questions. Um, you have two choices of compression. You have all I and you have IPB. And again, we have this option because of the Digic 5 Plus processor. Uh, you have the ability to choose all I, which is really the best for any sort of editing. So if you guys are really into video, you're doing music videos, you're doing you know, shorts, you're doing stuff where you're very heavily editing, you're going to want to choose all I, which is really compressing every frame by frame by frame. So essentially, this is making the video file larger but you're better off in the long run if you want to make any fine tunes. The IPB takes the frame before it and the frame after it and compresses it to make you a smaller file, but it's incredibly hard to go back and edit because everything is super compressed. But if you don't have that much space on your card, you know, you make, if you're shooting just straight out of camera for web, these are things that you have to determine, but you have the option, which is pretty cool. Uh, this four gig file size limit is gone. You have the ability to shoot 29 minutes and 59 seconds. Two points to tell me why it's 29 minutes and 59 seconds. Does anyone know? Yes. Good. It's not an overheating issue. I hear that all the time. Oh, it'll overheat, it'll overheat. No, it's not going to overheat. But in Europe, there's a 30% tax for video cameras or something <laughs> like that. And so some lawyer in a room somewhere was like, well, you know what? It can't be 30 minutes, but it can be 29 minutes and 59 seconds, and there was the loophole. Okay? So this is going to be continuous video. You're not going to have to restart it every 12 minutes or 4 gigs. Um, it's not going to create one folder. It's going to create multiple 4 gig folders, but it is a continuous video without any skip. Okay? Um, these should have been filled in. They were told to me. No idea what they are, though. Totally, that, that information was gone. What's been corrected for tremendously is more and rolling shutter. Okay, so who, who's really into the video aspect of these DSLRs? Anybody getting really into it? So you're going to see a noticeable difference in more or the lack of more and um, very less rolling shutter, which is you know awesome for you guys. 
You can time code it, you can let it free run, or you can let it record run. You also have the ability to um, sync multiple cameras together and time code them and uh, start them all at the same time. Uh, this can either be tethered or um, through the transmitter, but again, I'm not exactly sure. There aren't even any accessories for me to access. They don't exist. Like, they exist. There are pictures of them, but I've never seen them. So it's all in theory. You have the ability to uh, manage audio recording while you're shooting. Now, there is no headphone jack out. There is one in the 5D Mark III. There is a, there's a mic in, but there's no mic, uh, headphone out. But you still have the ability to edit your video uh, sound while you're doing it. And the cool thing that Canon did was they created this movie Silent Control, which takes the quick control dial and makes it touch sensitive so that you don't have to go ahead and spin that quick control dial in the back anymore to get the click, 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 click. Um, you will pick up any sort of image stabilization. You will pick up, if you're manually focusing, you will will pick up if the camera auto focuses. It's still an internal mic. So if you want to eliminate for any sort of camera sound, you're going to have to plug in an external mic. Um, but other than that, this quick control dial has been turned into something uh, similar to the iPod Classic. Wow, the iPod has a classic version of it. Isn't that wild? Um, where it's touch sensitive that you would go left, right, up, and down uh, to control your ISO, your exposure, your sound, your exposure comp. And, the and so on and so forth. So someone asked me about the battery. The battery is the same size as your old one series batteries. The charger is almost exactly the same, but it's an LP LPE4N. Well, it's a little bit higher capacity of a battery. You can put your older batteries on a new charger. Uh, you can put your newer batteries on an old charger, but just note that it may not give you a very accurate um, battery reading. Okay, it may give you an inaccurate battery reading when marrying your stuff backwards. But it's not going to explode. It's not going to over singe. It'll be fine. Okay, you just may have to leave it on for that extra half hour just to make sure that it's fully charged. The WFT unit, I have never seen in action, but essentially it is a wireless transmitter. Um, it does not go on the bottom. It has a dedicated slot on the side. So you can't use the wireless transmitter and the GPS unit at the same time because they both fit into the same slot. Okay? But if you really need to do any sort of transfer to, uh, and you wanted a geotag, you can essentially do Ethernet out to whatever you're shooting tethered, and you can put the, um, the GPS unit in. So there is a way around it. So the GPS unit fits in the same socket as the wireless transmitter. Um, there's time synchronization. It's dust and weather resistant, which is pretty cool. Uh, it has an electronic compass. Um, and it records well attitude, longitude, elevation, and UCT time. Uh, and it'll actually show up in the metadata of your uh, program, and you can see it in, in DPP. So that's pretty much it without putting uh, too much information in your brain. I thank you guys for coming, and I hope to see you guys around here at the event space for some more stuff. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.